Kings. The Kings are not hiring Sam Hinkie and have no plans to bring anyone in above Vlade. Open parentheses. They're searching for someone above Vlade. Closed parentheses. You are locked on fantasy basketball. Your daily podcast on fantasy basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Fantrax and Basketball Monster. And today's Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast is also brought to you by Jonathan Detuno, who's today's Patreon sponsor. If you want to be a Patreon sponsor of the show, head to patreon.com slash redrock underscore b-ball. My name is Josh Lloyd and you can find me on Twitter at redrock underscore b-ball, the same on Instagram. And Facebook is facebook.com slash Red Rock Basketball, where you can watch all shows streamed live, which we're currently going live now. So welcome if you are watching live. This one is a little bit later, so majority of you guys in the States, I assume, will be asleep when this is going live. But never fear, you can always check it out afterwards. That is the beauty of podcasts, of course. We're going to talk about all the action from Monday. We're going to preview Tuesday's games. So let's get to it. To it. But before we do that, it was the last day yesterday of all of the Red Rock listener leagues, the Dynasty leagues, the head-to-head leagues, the Rotisserie leagues are still going, so keep going with those ones, obviously, but all the head-to-head leagues are done. So I'm gonna announce the winners. Now, I don't have everyone's name. I've got all their team names, but sometimes people put in aliases as usernames and team names. So this is your, your team name. So congratulations if it was you, the winner of the Red Rock Points League, which is actually the first fantasy league that my son participated in. He came fifth in that. The winner of that was Team Clark Shark. And I know that's uh, that's Clark that won that one. So congratulations to Clark. He was uh, on top all season and uh, a worthy winner. The Red Rock Dynasty League, a league, a dynasty league that's in its second season, 400 players deep, 16 teams, a really competitive league. Tyler Watts uh, won that one. You would have you probably would have seen Tyler's work around. He writes for... Now, I'm going to get this wrong. I know he writes for Hashtag Basketball. I think he writes for Royal Pain. He is on the Watch the Boxes, on the Watch the Boxes podcast as well with Mike. And he used to be on the Daily Fantasy Basketball podcast with Kyle McEwen and Mark Roberts. So you would have seen Tyler around. So he won the Red Rock Dynasty League, beating Kevin Lappin in the final. So that's a, that's a real fun league. That one myself, uh, Matt Smith, Mark Roberts, uh, we're all in that league. The other four Dynasty Leagues we had, we had the two, we had four 30 team Dynasty Leagues. Two of them were the. Um, real salary cap leagues and two of them were the regular type of leagues the two salary cap league winners were the judd Buschler division grand theft otto congratulations to you and the reggie evans division eric sporopoulos who is the host of the 94 foot 94 feet 94 feet pod, uh, 94 feet report podcast um which is over i believe on the 16 windsor ring network if i'm not mistaken eric i apologize if i got that wrong but uh, eric is the uh is the winner of the reggie evans division for the two they're the two salary cap leagues for the non-salary cap 30 team leagues the bernard king division eric won that i don't think it's the same eric but a different eric and the steph curry division was won by trent copeland australian cricketer trent copeland who was uh, absolutely tearing apart fantasy this year pulling in a a sizable amount of profits for the two leagues that I'm in with him. He won both of those. So congratulations to Trent. Let's go through the other leagues. Now, the winners of all of these other head-to-head 12-team leagues will then get themselves a spot in the Champions League for next season. We'll talk about the winner of the Champions League as well. But all these guys who won their leagues in in the regular listener leagues, they'll get a spot in the head-to-head champion league along with the champion of the Champions League this year, myself and Matt Smith. We are automatically grandfathered a spot into the, uh, to those uh, Champions League because we run it. The Dante Jones division, the team was just called Funke. So I don't know if your name was Tobias or what it is, but Funke, you won that. Ithithmios Rencias was won by Mubic or Mubic BC. Jermaine O'Neal, a double up winner. Grand Theft Auto took out the Dynasty League, took out the Jermaine O'Neal division. So we'll see you in the Champions League next season as well. The Kobe Bryant division was won by Greek Wall. The Lorenzen Wright division was won by Small Ball Rocks. The Ray Allen division was won by Ballaholic. The Samaki Walker division was won by Bruce. And the Sharif Abdul Rahim division was won by Beauty and the Geek. The Steve Nash division by Dirk's Destiny. The Todd Fuller division by Team Goatbrook and the Walter McCarty division by Team Toby C. 
and Toby. I know that's I know your name's Toby. So Toby, congratulations! And then the winner of the Champions League. So the winner of all the head-to-head -head leagues last year got together into a league with myself and Matt, and the winner of that one, Christopher. Um, so congratulations, Christopher, for knocking that one off. We'll see you along with all those other winners in the Champions League next year. So congrats to you guys. The same situation will happen with the Roto Leagues. The 12 winners of those leagues will meet up in a Champions Roto League next season. So congratulations to all you people who, uh, who happen to win those Red Rock Leagues this season. Let's now get stuck in and talk about the action from Monday. The monstrous line of the night, once again, goes to Anthony Davis of the New Orleans Pelicans, 36.17 rebounds, but the real damage was, well, not the real damage, that's a lot of damage there, but the other damage was done in the other categories. Three assists, but three steals, three blocks, 12 of 23 from the field and 11 of 14 from the line. No DeMarcus Cousins again, so Davis got, got it cracking. The last three games have been ludicrous for Davis. At least 30 points, at least 15 boards in three consecutive games. Three steals in two of those games five blocks across the games, minimum field goal percentage of 52%. Just ridiculous. And for the people who took the risk on Davis, who picked him at pick nine or pick 10 or pick 12 or shit in the second round in some cases, it's worked out pretty well for you. He's the fourth ranked player for this season. He's already played 70 games and we've got you know, quite a few to go. So he is, um, you can talk about the games he leaves early and you can use whatever lame-ass joke you want to about, oh, I think he might have uh, bruised his labia. Cool. That's funny. But he's been awesome. He's the fourth-ranked player in per-game value. He has played top 10 amount of minutes in the NBA. You know, leaving a game early has an impact in DFS, yes, but in general, he's been ridiculously good this year. He is averaging 28 points, 12 rebounds, 1.2 steals, 2.2 blocks, 51% from the field, 80% from the line. He's hitting only 31% of his three, so big room for improvement there as well, and really has fallen off a little bit in the last two weeks at 18% from three. But Davis has been crazy. Yes, DeMarcus Cousins has hurt him a little, but not really. His numbers are still ridiculous. Like, not much is really changing. Post All-Star, he's averaging more points than his season average, more rebounds than his season average. The thing that's gone down there is his block numbers, but his efficiency has gone up as well. So it hasn't really been too much of a, a negative impact of the arrival of DeMarcus Cousins. And it's going to be very interesting to see what happens with him next season. Will the injury stigma stick with him? Will it cause him to go outside the top five? Almost definitely. I think there's no way he's going in the top five, despite him being the fifth ranked player or fourth ranked player. Um, and I reckon if you look at nine cat value, I don't have that in front of me, but I reckon he'd be the number one player if I, if I had to guess um, because of his low turnovers, obviously. Where's he going to go? Seventh again? Ninth? Tenth? How long does it take for that risk to go? That risk is still associated with Brook Lopez, who's played three consecutive full seasons now. So how long does it take for that perceived injury risk to disappear? I guess we'll find out. But it's been a huge year from Big Tone Davis. The waiver wire line of the night, Corey Joseph of the Toronto Raptors. 15 points, six rebounds, but the kicker here is the 13 assists. Career high for Corey. A block, a three, six of 10 from the field. So big, big assist numbers, obviously really helping. And Joseph's been okay. Since he's been starting post All-Star, he's the 112th ranked player, averaging 11, four, and five. And that's not spectacular. Under a steal, under a three a game. But what he does bring are those five assists. He brings 47% shooting from the field, which is a positive for a point guard as well. But he doesn't do much else. He's not a big scorer. He's not hitting threes. He's not getting steals. He doesn't give you free throw percentage. He doesn't really give you a huge amount in other areas. But those assists can be a real difference maker at this point of the year. So as I always say, is he a must own? Not really at this point of the year. The list of must owns at this point of the year is pretty low. But you want assists. He's bringing it to you. And, and he, he's not really hurting you in... Um, in many other um many other areas so that's i guess that's always a a positive that you should be looking at with Corey joseph is, is he's not coming in and, and demolishing your free throws or demolishing your field goal percentage he's really you know putting up solid numbers most of the time and, and that's that's good stuff so another another good game from Corey joseph probably his best game but yeah good stuff there anyway the young gun of the night what's well, so just yep 
Kristaps Porzingis, talk about the Knicks a little bit later. 25 and 8 for Kristaps, a 3, 3 assists, 2 steals and 3 blocks. Big peripheral numbers, 10 of 16 from the field and 4 of 4 from the free throw line. He has dipped a little bit, definitely, but for all the people saying that he's going to get shut down and he's done for the year, he's come back strong. He's the 28th ranked player post All-Star, averaging 18 and 8, playing 33 minutes a night and blocking over 2 shots a game. Um, almost a steal a game in that time and hitting over a three as well, 83% from the line. You know, back to the numbers that he was putting up at the start of the season. He had that bit of a, a lull in the middle where he was battling that Achilles problem, but he's just back to the sort of the same guy. And I do really think that he's going to be able to take another big step forward next season. And it's been um, it's been impressive to see what he's doing at, at the moment, especially this big sort of comeback when, again, plenty of people were ready to get rid of him, sell him, drop him because of you know, perceived shutdowns which again, majority of the time, don't happen. They do sometimes, but majority of the time, they don't happen, especially when they, people start talking about them, which is often at the beginning of January, which is a ludicrous time to start uh, to start considering that, I, I believe. But Porzingis putting up some uh, some really good numbers there, obviously another big big night from him. The dud of the night, Ennis Cantor of the Oklahoma City Thunder, six points, two rebounds, that is a disgusting line. No threes, no steals, no blocks, no assists, and he did not shoot the ball well. He's been pretty good. He's a top 100 player after after the break, averaging 15 and a half and seven in under 22 minutes. He does not much else in the counting stats, but really good percentages, 57 and 79. They're really useful and on decent volume as well, and can be a positive contributor in those categories. But when he has a night like this, it's not great, but this comes on the back of two 20 plus scoring performances. So I don't look at it and go, oh, can't a shit. We need to get rid of him. Um, but again, it does all just come down to need at this point of the year. Do you need points, boards, field goal percentage? Because that's really what you're getting from Cantor. Is that making a difference? Is it going to... Are you that far ahead in those categories where it's not necessary? Or are you that far behind where you can't come back? And it's hard to say that after one day, but you can generally get an idea. And if that if that's the case, then move on. Get rid of him. But otherwise... Most nights, he's going to do what he does, and, and what he does is um, and what he does is, is put up you know, pretty solid numbers. And, and this, he scored six points here, but he'd scored since the um since the All Star break, he'd scored in double digits in every game bar the first game post break. So you know, pretty consistent level of scoring from Ennis Cantor. Before we head on to look at these uh other games now I'll just check if anyone's left any questions i'm not sure there's not there's not that many people listening live so no questions have come through so we can get straight into talking about the games now from from monday's action the first one we'll talk about is orlando and toronto the magic lord alfred payton another pretty good night or very good night 22 points and nine assists he added a steal he had a block he was 67 percent from the field he has been really really good since the serge Barker trade through march he's been fantastic multiple triple doubles and putting up numbers that make you think well, maybe he can be a starting point guard on a on an average team he's taken significant strides forward and has been a fairly reliable fantasy guy ever since frank vogels decided you know what probably we shouldn't give cj watson starters minutes Terry Ross, against his former team, threw down some dunks, had 17 points. Weirdly, didn't hit any threes, but still had 17 points and four steals, so some tremendous use there. He's obviously not going to shoot at this level, and he's probably going to hit threes on most nights, so it's a bit of a trade-off. But if you're owning him, you know exactly why it is. It's, it's points, it's, uh, it's threes and steals, and it's not a lot else. But after that little slump, he's had about three or four games in a row that have been solid. Evan Fournier had 20 points with a pair of threes and a pair of steals, while Nikola Vucevic in 29 minutes had 12, 15, and 4. And a big part of Vucevic's game, game this season, which I think has been underrated, is his ability to get assists has been much improved, especially the last month or two. Really, really underrated part of his game. Aaron Gordon had 16 points in 36 minutes. I love to see him get 36 minutes. He had one rebound, which is impossibly baffling. How does he get one rebound? He did have two steals, but... Uh, overall, Gordon, not not a must-own guy. Prob uh, should be owned, but not not a must-own player. Not much else to really talk about with the Magic here. They uh, they got pummeled 131 to 112 by the Toronto Raptors. On to the Raptors, there was no Damari Carroll again, so PJ Tucker started. He played 33 minutes, had his usual seven points, but added a three, had five boards, had three steals, had one block. He's a, like a Tabo Cephalosha sort of a player. He won't score, but he'll rebound the ball well. He'll get your steals, and he'll hit a couple of threes, and that can be useful in the right situation. 
Jonas Valanciunas, I did posit yesterday that maybe this was an opportunity for JV to play some extra minutes and put up a good game, and lo and behold, it actually worked out. 17-9 and nine for Valanciunas with a block in 27 minutes. The next time that happens, I've got no idea when it's going to go down, but I don't think that this sort of performance sways me and goes, yeah, Casey's going back to JV and he's going to play him 28 and 9. He's probably going to get 21 in the next game and have, you know, 8 and 4, and that's not going to help anybody. Sergio Barker, 16 and 7 against his former team. Solid without being spectacular. Or DeMar DeRozan, a weird night for DeRozan. 36 points in 36 minutes. That's good. No steals, no blocks. 62% from the field, amazing. 64% from the line on 14 attempts. Weirdly low from DeMar DeRozan. Just one of those weird things that happens. I like D-Line right. D-Line played 18 minutes. He had seven points, but he added three assists. He added three steals. He added two blocks. Now, 18 minutes a night is not someone that I'm adding and going, yeah, let's ride him out here unless I'm in a 20-team league, but clearly ahead of Fred Van Vliet playing minutes on the wing and producing whenever he gets the opportunity. So he is a name to watch when you get Saturday, Sunday, desperation times. Hey, I need some steals. Maybe Dillon Wright's around. Maybe in his 20 minutes he can get me two steals because that's not a crazy theory for Dillon. And he has been putting up some good numbers. Norm Powell also got hot 16 points with four triples in 24 minutes. Love him. But how often is it going to happen? That's the problem. The minutes are just too limited for my liking despite how much I do, um, despite how much I do like him as a player. Did have a question come in now from Yuval Hamer. He says, I just dropped Mark Gasol for Rishon Holmes. What's your guess about Mark playing this week? Well, since you dropped him, I'm going to tell you he plays in the next game, but I'm joking. I don't know. At this point, he will. I think he will play. I just don't think it'll be the next game, which I believe is Wednesday for the Grizzlies, but I do think that Gasol will play this week. It just won't be the next one. So you need to make the move understandable. If your opponent grabs Mark Gasol, stiff shit, but it could also hurt them. So it might not be a, a a terrible decision in that sense, but if you need the active spots, if you need games in, I'm not sure I would have gone straight away and dropped Gasol on the first day of the week. Pro I probably wouldn't myself, but I understand the desperation that sometimes comes with it just to you know, make these moves and get worried about it. Detroit and the Knicks. Reggie Jackson, out of the lineup, did not dress. Rest. Now, a team that's fighting for a playoff spot and playoff seeding, it's pretty weird to rest your starting point guard, especially when Stan Van Gundy has come out with plenty of things saying he doesn't believe in rest. Now, I could go ahead and, and quote Stan Van Gundy in plenty of things. I won't, but the general tenor of his statements is resting is for pussies. Really, that, that's what he comes across. Speaking of Stan Van Gundy quotes, for him to come out and have a quote about Patrick Ewing today and call him, I think he's got the big package, um, Stan, you had to have meant that. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, the big rumor, urban legend is that Patrick Ewing has got a gigantically sized middle stump. So for Stan Van Gundy to come out and, and call Patrick Ewing the big package is very, very humorous when he's keeping a straight face and talking about coaching searches. The big package, Patrick Ewing, very, very impressed with that. Um, yeah, so for Van Gundy to come out and rail against resting and then rest your starting point guard, who's not a starter anymore, but you know what I mean. There's something else happening. It's the knee is still bothering him. Um, he's just not the same this year. There's no denying that. Now, the question that everyone now comes to me is, uh, Ish Smith, man, must own Ish Smith. And the question I pose to you with Ish Smith, I'm not saying that he's not a must own at this point. The question I pose to you is, was Ish Smith a must own player for November, when Reggie Jackson was out, how was Ish Smith's numbers there? Were they must own? And that's that's exactly what you should look at. Now today, Ish was good for 35 minutes, 15, 6, and 5 with a steal. They're very good counting numbers. Very good. But the question that, again, I ask you is what did Ish Smith do throughout October and November when he was the starter? The exact same scenario we're in now. No Reggie Jackson at all. He was all right. He was like... Back end, the 11th, 12th best guy on your roster, which if we weren't getting super hyped, the 12th best guy on your roster now, you'd look at him and go, I could probably dump that guy for a streamer. Ish is fine, but watch your percentages. 43% from the field today, negative. 50% from the line, a negative. And that's what he'll do, hurt you in both areas. Now, I'm not trying to say don't pick him up. I'm just trying to, again, as I, as I often try to do, is throw 
a second opinion or a, or a contrasting opinion on things when people are like, you know, really ready to like cut off their own nose to spite their face to go and grab him. Man, Ish Smith, man, it's over. I've won it. Oh, let's go. Let's go. I've won it. Ish Smith. Really? Again, Ish Smith is Ish Smith. Ish Smith is a career backup that barely cracks the league a lot of the time for for a certain reason. It's like picking up Corey Joseph and going, bang, it's over, guys, pack it away. You might not even bother setting your lineups now because I've got Corey Joseph. That's where Ish Smith falls to me. Great counting numbers, but there's going to be harmfulness and there are going to be shit nights because he's just not that good. Sorry for that Ish Smith rant, but I just need to you put that stuff. It's ter- definitely not a bad move to grab you. But again, have a look. Have a look how it will affect you in the negative areas that he produces because it will. It could be an issue. James Ellsworth, Benno Udry was back. 13 minutes, 6, 3-3 three and three with a steal. Deeper leagues, you want to pay attention here because getting three or four assists out of a waiver wire guy is big, big news. So Benno Udry comes into play in those deep performance while Kentavious Caldwell-Pope was thoroughly middling 12 points in 32. Toby Harris had 12, or Andre Drummond had 10 and 15 in just the 25 minutes in another blowout loss for the Pistons. Marcus Morris scored well for 20 points, four triples, didn't do much else in 33, but we discussed it yesterday. The Pistons have a very good schedule. They've still got two games in the next three days. They had three in the first four days of this week, so adding Ish has great value here. Adding Marcus Morris, obviously Contavious Caldwell Pope, when you've got Tuesday, Thursday coming up now. But now they fall into a, a situation with a multitude of other teams. We've got the Tuesday, Thursday, back-to-back Brooklyn, Phoenix, the, the Lakers, the Timberwolves, the Blazers. All those teams have got that Tuesday, Thursday as well. So it's not just the uh, not just the Pistons who have got that advantage. The Knicks, they won. This, if they had lost this game, they were mathematically eliminated from the playoffs. But they won, and now they cling to hope that they're getting back into the playoffs. For what reason? I don't know. The other thing I don't know is why come out and say we'll be limiting the minutes of our veterans if you're then going to go and play them more minutes than you've played them all season. Carmelo Anthony had a sore knee that caused him to miss two games. The shutdown crows were squawking. Mello came back. 35 minutes? And that's great if you own Mallow. 21, 3, and 5, 3 steals and 3 threes. But where's the common sense? Where's the consistency? Where's the backing up what you say? Now, I know that this has been the case of the Knicks all season. Misinformation upon misinformation upon confusing rotations, upon Derek Rose going missing and not telling anybody, uh, upon playing your backups more than your starters and alternating at every single game you know, refusing to play Porzingis at the five and then doing it for two games and then reverting and just everything being up shit creek that's common sense but man it is frustrating so we have to assume that these starters are going to play big minutes again until they are mathematically eliminated from the playoffs which could be as early as next game but you had Derek Rose injured with a sore foot you had Carmelo Anthony injured with a sore knee let's bring them back and play them 36 each what are you doing Derek Rose played 33. He had 27, 4, and 6 on 71% shooting. If we do Rose watch, he had zero threes, but he did have a steal. So there's a bonus there, but really good efficiency, really good assists, and really good points. A great night from Derek. Courtney Lee got his 33 minutes. He is more a 14 teamer, 7 and 7 with a pair of steals. Well, Bill Hernan Gomez started, had 15 and 5 in 27. So that means he's probably due for a 20 minute game in the next one, as we cannot understand what uh, Hornacek does here. Kylo Quinn went scoreless in 20 minutes, had six boards and one block. He is more that deeper league sort of a guy. Well, rugged Ronnie Baker down to the 15 minutes. But if they do decide to reverse course, reverse course, and go back and give the uh, backups more minutes and, and reduce the starters playing time, then rugged comes into some consideration in a 30-team league, maybe. That's probably about as, uh, as shallow as you'd want to go. Let's talk about the next game, the Cleveland Cavaliers and the San Antonio Spurs. I don't want to spend too much time on this because this was an ass-kicking of the highest order, 31-point margin to the Spurs. So minutes were spread all over the place. J.R. Smith remains terrible, I will say that. It's not an injury thing. It's not necessarily a fitting-in thing. He was terrible before the injury. He was terrible when they were firing on all cylinders to start the year. He's just been terrible. And he is just a three-point streamer, but otherwise not a lot to really care about with this because... The minutes were all over the place. The same thing for the Spurs. Who cares? Like, everyone didn't play enough. One thing I will say is this is a Danny Green special. Five points. And a lot of people would look at that box score, and it starts with five points, and they'd look at it and go, man, Danny Green, he's trash. He's uh, WOAT. 
five points, man. He's a starter. Why is he starting? We should play John Simmons. Um, you know, 10 million a year for this shit. And then you look at the rest. Oh, he had uh, two steals and four blocks as a shooting guard. And you go, okay, this guy is the best shot blocking guard in the NBA. If you don't count Giannis, of course, and even then he goes pretty close. His rim protection was ridiculous. His defense was ridiculous. Massive part of why the Spurs won this. And that is where the value of Dan Green sits. Now, he hasn't been as prolific in those areas, especially with his three-point shooting this year. But that is what he can do on a given ba- any nightly basis. LaMarcus Aldridge had 14 and 7 in his 29, while uh, Kawhi had 25, 6 and 6 with three steals. Not much else happening there for the Spurs because, as I said, a real bloodbath. The next game we're going to take a look at the Oklahoma City Thunder and the Dallas Mavericks. Russ with another triple double. They get the victory. He willed them to victory in this one. They were down and he got them back into it. One by a point 37, 13, and 10 with two steals and two triples. 15 of 30 from the field is is magnificent from a field goal percentage perspective. While Steve Adams got it happening defensively, two steals and two blocks, but not much else on the other end. Eight points and six boards, not a must own. While Vic Oladipo had 15 and nine with a very full line. Also three threes, a steal and a block there for Vic. Taj Gibson. DeMontis Sabonis was a DMP CD, which is good. It's what they should do. But Taj still plays 24 minutes. 13 points, 6 rebounds, 1 assist, and 1 block. Huge numbers. He has been ridiculous. And I have got Locked On Thunder podcast host Fred Katz going to Billy Donovan with this question tomorrow to ask, why is Taj Gibson playing so little? Why is he playing so well and playing so few minutes? Why is he stri- Why can he not crack 25 a night? Why was he at under 20 for a stretch of games? Even with Sabonis out of the rotation, why aren't you running with Taj and giving him 28 or 30 a night when it's clearly your best option? So I'll see what Fred says to Billy tomorrow, and we'll see what Mr. Donovan's response is. But I've got my man on the ground, and I'm trying to figure it out. But I, I, I don't understand it. I don't think anyone really understands it, given how well Taj is playing. Doug McDirt was terrible. Five points in 13 minutes for him. On to the Mavs. Nerlens. Big night from uh, Nerlens, 28 minutes, 15 and 8, 4 steals and 2 blocks. And this is why Nerlens has legitimate top 20 fantasy upside. Because those steal numbers and those block numbers, from a center especially with the steals, it's just ridiculous. I love that he's playing 28 minutes. I want him to play 30, but this is this is shit hot from Nerlens. He should be owned. Seth Curry out with a shoulder problem. So Yogi Ferrell back starting. 32 for Yogi, 13, 4, and 5, 3 steals and 3 threes. I don't know how long Seth's going to be out, but this shoulder's been bothering him for about a week or so. So I would have to imagine that he misses a couple more games, and Yogi's going to have value now. Go back and grab him, because he should have been dropped, but now you can grab him. The other guy you look at, of course, is JJ Barea, who played 29 minutes. He had 10 points with 8 assists and 2 triples. Those 8 assists are tasty. The 28 minutes is tasty. 29 minutes is tasty. But he is more a, say, 14-teamer or a 12-team streamer. Dirk had 8 and 8 in 25 minutes. Not a must-hold guy. While the pencil had just the 10 in 37 after a couple of strong games in, in a row before this one. Wes Matthews got his, um, got his scoring happening. Added 4 assists, which has been a real strength of Wes's lately. But 37 minutes, 15 points on 39% shooting. So got the scoring, didn't get the shooting going all that well. Now, I do have a question that's rolled in. I'll have a look at that now from Terry Stott, not the Blazers coach. In a dynasty league, would you try and trade for a buy low player that does not fit your build in an attempt to flip them for someone who does if you are not in win now mode? Yeah, I think in not in win now mode, acquiring assets is a very good way to go about it. Now, I did this in a 30-team league that I am in. I traded Jordan Clarkson at the start of the year for Clint Capella. I was not a punt free throw team, but I was rebuilding. I accumulated four first-round picks. I traded away Millsap and got two firsts for him. Traded away Michael Carter-Williams and got two firsts for him. Traded away Trevor Ariza, I think, and got two firsts, some of them future for him. And then I said, well, Capella's on the block here. Someone wants Clarkson. I think that Capella's going to be very much better than what Clarko could be. And I think that's great value for me. So I took him on. I wasn't a punt free throw guy, but if I need to and Capella becomes a beast, I can just re-maneuver my team around it. If not, then I've got a really interesting punt free throw chip on my team. And yeah, I think that's a great way of looking at it, Terry. If you're not winning now, acquire assets. You get guys you think that can blow up that you can then flip for something else, assuming your league has a pretty active trademark, because if it doesn't trade and you're stuck with them and you're not willing to change what you you do, then there's no point. But you should be able to re rejigger what you do from a uh, from a build 
point of view in a dynasty where you're not competing. But a good question, Terry. Let's now head on to the next game, Memphis at Sacramento. Zebo started with Marcus Sol out, 17 and 15 with a block. He shot 28%, so that was horrific. But still, those other numbers are real tasty. If Marcus Sol remains out, Randolph has value, but I wouldn't just be going and grabbing him now, especially when Memphis doesn't play on Tuesday, because um, what's the point? You're, you're wasting a, a potential gameplay situation, and I think Grizzlies play again on Wednesday, and you might not even be able to use him on a higher scheduled day. So there's no point in that, but it's a, it's a situation worth monitoring. Conley had 22, 3, and 9, while Brandon Wright had an efficient 11 points on 71% shooting. He can be a field goal percentage influencer, and that can be hard to find, especially while, while uh, Gasol is out. You might be able to stream right in for a day, get a few points, get a block, get five, six rebounds, but more importantly, really start to grind on that field goal percentage, and that can be a real useful thing. Jamichael Green, only 10 and 4, only played 21 minutes, even with Gasol out, that's a little bit frustrating, while Tone Allen got the one steal, so still just cranking along in that zone. Jim Ennis played 30 in the last game, today it was Troy Daniels' turn, neither guy was sexy, so nothing much to us see with them. The Kings, they are very, very hard to pick, very hard to know what's going on on a daily basis, because as I said, they're rotating guys in resting on a, on a daily basis, that continues to happen. And it happened again today. We had Aaron Aflalo resting and Tyreek Evans resting. But then we had a complete change in philosophy because Dave Yeager said, I want to win against my former team. Screw player development. Screw um, increased lottery balls. Screw that. I want to beat my former team. So I'm going to play my veterans. I'm going to give Costa Kufos 30 minutes. I'm going to give Aaron Anthony Tolliver 23 minutes. I'm going to give 34 to Garrett Temple. I'm going to not play your just Papianis a single minute. I'm going to limit Scalavisier to nine minutes because I have to get a victory against my former team because I'm a petty something. I didn't even know what to say. I understand it, and I'm sure there's locker room dynamics there, and it might have even been, Coach, we know that this is your team coming in. Let's go hard. You know, not, to, not that they don't go hard every game, but a real change in coaching philosophy just to get a meaningless win against a former employee it seems counterproductive. Helps Jaeger's ego, I'm sure. Maybe it helps morale in the locker room for the next nine games of losing. I don't know. But that's definitely what happened here. So Kufos had 11 and 5 with two steals and three blocks. He won't do this again. Pretty much guaranteed. Darren Collison played 37 minutes and had 23, 4 and 7. He won't do this again. Will Corley Stein, 12 and 9. Well, he's a chance to do that again. Anthony Tolliver, 9, 5 and 2 in 23 minutes. Won't play this many minutes again. Bud healed 14 and 4 with two threes. That's pretty consistent for him, and he has 12 team value in most cases. As for the Bissier, three points in nine minutes. That's two absolute turds in a row. There's no reason to be holding scale in any any non-keeper 12 team formats or shit, even 14 team leaguers at the moment. And as I said, Papianis out of the rotation entirely because again, needed to get that victory. Must win game for the Kings. The last game of the night, the Pelicans and the Jazz. No Boogie, no Gordo Haywood, no Derek Favors. So lots of stars out, but Anthony Davis didn't care. He just went off. And as did Drew Holiday with a very a very decent line, not a spectacular line, but pretty good. 19, 2, and 5, two steals, one block, three triples, and shot the ball well, as he always seems to do when Boogie is out. Big night from Drew. Dante Cunningham started, and he remains one of the worst starters in the NBA when he does start. Eight points in 39 minutes, while Geordie Crawford played 30. 14 points with two triples. That's basically Buddy Heald production. This is another reason why I say if someone's only value, Eric Gordon, Lou Williams, Ryan Anderson, Wes Matthews, if their value is three-pointers, there is no point in holding them because you can just add any dickhead off the waiver why Troy Daniels, Geordie Crawford, they're getting you two a game. The Duke Wayne Ellington, they're getting you three a game. That's where you get your threes from. It's very, very easy to find that. Whereas finding assists from a guy like Timmy Frazier is harder. He had four points with six assists and two steals. He's assisting at a very big rate so far. Limited turnovers. He's not playing many minutes. He played 36 in the last one in what was a blowout. But he's going to play these mid-20s, and he's going to get you four to five assists, and he won't turn it over, and he'll get you some steals. And if that works for you, by all means, that's the way you need to approach everything at this point of the year. On to Utah. No Gordy Haywood, no Derek Favors. I just don't know when we're going to see... Um, um, I don't know when we're going to see Derek Favors play again, unfortunately. Oh, I hope it's soon, but shit, this guy has just been banged up all season. I'll tell you who's a monster, though. Rudy Gobert. 
20 and 19 for Gobert. A steal and five blocks with 73% from the field. But I'll tell you what's interesting about Rudy Gobert. And you know, I don't know what it is, but there's definite biases amongst players. I probably have them. I'm sure I have them. But if this was DeAndre Jordan, Andre Drummond, Dwight Howard going out there and going five, four of eight from the line, and that's the volume and the percentage he's been shooting over the last couple of weeks around that mark, there'd be innumerable, man, this guy gets paid $20 million a year. He's a professional. Why doesn't he go to the gym and hit his free throws? It's simple, man. Just stay in the gym and shoot free throws. These players today, they're so lazy. They don't even work. They do nothing for their game. They just turn up. They don't shoot free throws. I can never own Rudy Gobert or Andre Drummond or Dwight Howard or um, DeAndre Jordan on my team because they can't shoot free throws. But Rudy Gobert over the last month has been a huge negative in that category and he's probably costing you that every week that you play. But he's being universally praised, and so he should. You know, I'm all for these guys that punt free throws. I've got no problem with it. But you can't denigrate these other guys. And this run from Rudy has been really negative. And it is something you do have to pay attention to. I just don't know why he doesn't get... You know, he's not shooting as bad as those other guys. But recently, it's been almost as negatively impactful. And that's what we care about in fantasy. Georgie Hill took it up a notch with Gordo out, 17, 2, and 5. And how's Jingling Joe Ingles? He is going to get a significant contract in the offseason, and some people are going to um, going to shit themselves. They're going to um, have a real issue with um, Joe Ingles getting paid, but he's going to get paid. 19, 4, and 4 for Jingling. He hit five triples. He had a steal. He's ridiculously good. Now, he's not a strong ad. He's a deeper league ad because, again, the Jazz don't play Tuesday. They play Wednesday. Low scheduled day. We don't know if Gordo plays. But if Gordo's out, Ingles is going to put up numbers. It's pretty much a guarantee. Rocket Rodney Hood with a big night. Huge from him. 26 and 3. Four triples. This is the rocket that we, or that I hoped that we'd see. This is the one that I thought would take the third year jump. In fact, that the fa fact is his knee has just been an absolute dog's breakfast for the majority of this season. It's really impacted what he can do. I reckon we're going to see a big rocket season next year. But he's been a disaster so far. So when Gordo comes back, he might go back to 28 minutes. He's not a strong ad. Boris Dia started there, so that's great. Two points with four assists there, and uh, Joe Johnson had 14, 7, and 6 with a really good night in 31 minutes for Joe with both Gordo and Derek Favors out. All right, I'm going to uh, take a quick break now because for some reason my mouth is as dry as a nun snatch, so I'm going to have to uh, take a bit of a swig of water. And then we're going to come back and we're going to talk DFS action for Tuesday. everyone we're back let's talk perfect dfs lineups on fangio Derek rose 42.8 Corey joseph 38.7 and vic oladipo 30.8 rocket rodney hood 30.7 Kawhi at 47.2 joe johnson 30.4 porzingis at 40.8 tone davis 70.7 gobert at 50.3 53.1 sorry and the total is 392.5 and that cost fifty nine thousand five hundred dollars 
if we go over onto DraftKings, Derek Rose had 43, Rocket had 33 and a half, Joe Ingles 33, Zebo 41.75, Gobert 56, Corey Joseph 43 and a half, Tone Davis 74, and Porzingis at 49.5 for a total of 374.25, and that cost 49,200. Question from John Tiet. Who do you think is the leading candidate for sixth man of the year award so far? Good question, without notice. So I don't have everything in front of me, but off the top of my head, I would take um, Eric Gordon. But, but I reckon Jim Johnson's real close. He has been an absolute monster for that Heat team. And I would, I reckon I want to get into the details of it. I reckon I'd have him pretty close. Who's your pick? John, who, who do you think sixth man of the year is? Listeners, who do you think is sixth man of the year? No, I'm changing it. I'm going Jim Johnson until I get a chance to uh, peruse the numbers and the facts. But just off the top of my head, that is the uh, direction I am going. John, no, I'm not saying who I think is going to win it because voters vote for who scores the most points because points are good. So that's a different story. And points are good. Points win you the game, but it's not everything there is about it. So I'm, uh, I'm provisionally voting for Jimmy Johnson because he made me proud. Let's talk about the games that we have got coming up on Tuesday. The first game, there are eight of them. The first game we're going to talk about is the Milwaukee Bucks. They're taking on the Charlotte Hornets. Injury-wise, we're good. And that's always a positive. Let's talk point guards. Kemba Walker, $7,800. He's got a... A decent matchup. It's not a terrible one, especially for a player like him. I think there are better ones out, better better um, point guard prices out there for guys. But I don't hate it. He's averaging 42 over his last three and 36 over his last five, which are very, very good numbers. They're very useful numbers. But he's not a lock. At 8,000 on DraftKings, it's much less interesting. But it still has, I guess, a, a little bit of a level of intrigue. As for Brogo at 5,600, that's that's probably pushing a little bit too high. Now, I know he's played 30 minutes the last three games, but it is Jason Kidd. So we're probably looking at a 22-minute game coming up here, and that's really going to screw with what he can do. And I just don't know if his upside's high enough for me to consider him as a GPP guy, because that's all I'd really be, or all I'd really be looking at him as. At shooting guard, Nicola Batum is at 6,700. Yeah, he's been good. I'm, I'm just, I just feel like he consistently is overpriced. So I'm not not feeling Batum just at this point. 7,000 on DraftKings. Yanni at 10-3. I think you have to love him as a GPP guy. I'm not sure I'd want to go with him in cash, but at 10,300, he can clear 65, no problem. And that provides significant value there. I just don't know if he's a lock for 50, which I'd probably want him to be in a cash game. I'm just not quite sure we're there yet. He's at 97 on DraftKings. So I feel much better about that for cash, just that different scoring system and the lower um, salary, I feel better about him there, but not not quite as sold on him on Fangio. 6,300 for Chris Middleton. I like Chris. Good matchup for Chris. 6,300. Mm. I like 62 on DraftKings. I like the three-point bonus for his scoring. He's averaging 28 in the last five, which is not great at 6,200, but this is a very good matchup for Chris. So I reckon he's, he's definitely worth a look. He's, he's worth more look on DraftKings, but he's absolutely worth a go. On FanDuel as well. Kid Gilchrist had a big game in the last one, but I'm not sure that I uh, expect that to repeat. And Tone Snell's not not doing it for me. Frank the Tank at 5,400. I'm not interested in him at that price. He'd want to be 4,500 before I really get involved. He's at 52 on DraftKings. I just I just don't see any consistency or upside really. 65 for Marvin Williams, another player on the Hornets who just is continually too highly priced. At center, Cody Zeller. Great matchup for Cody. 5,300 is his price tag, and he's averaging over 30 points in his last five. He is hitting 5x value four of his last six games. Some real value here, and I'm not sure how high his upside is. In fact, I don't think it's that high. I don't think he's got great tournament upside. But in a matchup against the Bucks, a guy like Cody Zeller can be really useful as, as your center, so no problem considering him. Greggy Munro at 6,000. I'm not willing to go down that route just yet. If you want to go Spencer Hawes, good luck to you, but I'll also send you your address so you can just post me your money. Minnesota at Indiana. The paces are favored by five. The total is 208. Rodney Stuckey, who's dealing with that knee issue, 
we need to uh, see whether he plays or not. Because if he doesn't, it does help guys like CJ Miles and a guy like Monte Ellis as well, especially with Glenn Robinson the third already out. Oh, Jefferson is out as well with that ankle sprain that we um that we uh, thought was going to be much more serious. But thankfully, at this point, he's just missing a couple of games. We'll see if that changes. Remember, Michael Beasley was just missing a couple of games as well, and that was three weeks ago. Still haven't seen super cool bees come back, and don't know if we will, because he had a, a knee sprain that was costing him two games. Remember that, Bucks? Been a while. Might want to do something about updating that. At point guard, Jeff Teague, 7,300, taking on the Timberwolves. He plays well against Rubio and the Wolves. So, you know, I'm not too against Jeff. He's been putting up some pretty decent numbers, but I'm not sure they're quite at that level. And there are going to be better other, other better point guard options out there. At 71 on DraftKings, he's better. It's a better situation, a 36 average over the last five. I could get behind using him in cash and GPP over on DraftKings, but I'm not really feeling it for FanDuel. At, as for Rick Rubio, 7,700 for Rick. Love him, but I'm not not having that not having that price tag. That's just not not happening for me outside of a GPP, of course. But in cash, no way. Monte Ellis, four thousand four hundred. I don't like Monte Ellis. You're probably aware of that. I thought he was washed up as an NBA player. I still sort of uh, I still sort of buy into that. But in this spot, with Rocket Rodney Hood, not Rocket Rodney Hood, Rocket Rodney Stucky. Or maybe he's not Rocket. He's just Stucky. With Stucky potentially out, with the little dog potentially, or definitely out, Monte is going to get some extra run here and do a bit of ball handling in the second unit. Had 23 in the last game. He's averaging 21 over the last five. He's got, you can get 24, 25 points, and at 4,400, that's not a bad cash option. It's a good matchup for him. He's at 46 on DraftKings. Yeah, there's, there's, something, there's something there with Monte Ellis. Chris Dunn is another guy that you could throw in. It's 4,300 minutes in the 20s for three consecutive games. Decent production for the last couple of games as well. I don't feel fully locked in that he's going to just be supplanting Brandon Rush, but I feel pretty good about it. I feel pretty confident about it. And at 4,300, that's definitely not as sexy as minimum salary, which I would have been much more much more into. And there's something there. DraftKings, Chrissy Dunn's at 3,300. Really, really like that. I think there's great GPP upside. I'd be stunned, I reckon, if he didn't break 6x value at 3,300. Just given the pattern of what Thibodeau's done the last couple of games and the way that Dunn's responded to it, and he might have a shit scoring game, but the thing about Dunn, from a DFS point of view, if he does have a shit scoring game, he can get assists, he can get steals, he can block some shots, he can get some boards, he can do some other things. He's not Alan Crabb here. He can do other things, and that does help. So that's um, yeah, 3,300, really, really good value, and, and it is worth exploring. Other shooting guards... No, small forward, Wigo. Yeah, um, 7,200 for Wigo. There's a little bit of upside there. Against Paul George, though, I'm not really feeling it. I think I'll pass on Wiggins unless you know, you're putting in multiple GPPs and then your know, numerous players become options. And he, he becomes a decent option in that sense, but he's not a he's not a single entry type guy, I don't think. Paulie George at 8,600. I feel okay about him in cash. Yeah, at least going to get that 40. I think you'll get to 40 or get close to it anyway, and he's got a bit more upside there. So I do like Paul, while CJ Miles is down to minimum salary on FanDuel because he's doing nothing, and so that's fair enough. And he's got upside. We know that. And if there's a couple of injuries there, then maybe maybe you take take a peek at that and think that, okay, he, he can get me that money back. Power forward, the Deuce Young, 4,200. Absolutely dreadful recently. And at 4,200, the upside is, is obviously there. There is no way that I would use that in cash. No way at all. I would consider it in a GPP, and I think it's actually not a bad GPP option, just because if he the risk somehow stays on and he plays 32 minutes, then he, then he could have 28 points, 29 points, and that's 7x value. And that can be good, but he's been the opposite of that. And the opposite of good is undeniably shithouse. And that's where he's been. Gorgie Jeng, big game, last one, 5,100. I feel all right about Gorgie breaking that 5X barrier here too. So I think he's a pretty solid play. Over on DraftKings at 55, I'm less interested in that. At center, Miles Turner really is turning it on at the moment, pun unintended, 6,700. But the price is um, bounced up as well, just to, to turn it off. 6,700 on both. It's, it's okay. It's definitely not core. It's not lock-in. It's probably not cash. It's it's okay. Carl Anthony Towns, a big money guy, ten thousand five hundred for Townsy. 
over his last two weeks, he hasn't reached the value that would give you 5x at 10,500. Hasn't hit that level. There's obviously a chance for him to do it. And if you're spending up at center, he's the option to go for. But he hasn't done it. So that is something to pay attention to. Miles Turner, though, has led in some big gains from some centers who uh, who can be offensive, offensively dominant. And that's what you would call town. So, yeah, there's there's clear 50-point upside here for Townsy. Shabazz Muhammad's another guy that I didn't mention. He's at 4000 bucks, and I didn't mention him for a reason because I just don't really... On a day like this, I'm not really feeling Shabazz as being this core guy that's going to really turn it around for you. Sorry, Shabazz. I'm sure you care. Next up, Miami and Detroit. No spread for this one, but we know that Reggie Jackson is out already. He will not play. He will rest again. Um, we don't know if the other Reggie, Reggie Bullock, will play. He is um, he's putting up um, nothing, so no, nothing more to really uh, to really care about. Let's talk point guards, and we'll start with Ish. He's at forty five hundred. I talked about him for a lot at the start. At forty five hundred, almost impossible not to use him. That is a stupidly low price because they didn't know that this was going to be the case. They knew that he would start, but they didn't know that Reggie Jackson would be eliminated from the lineup completely. And that's where we are. So Ish Smith at forty five hundred. He is going to be as chalk as anything, and that's okay in cash. But in GPPs, you probably don't want to go that direction. He's at five thousand on DraftKings. Worse, but still pretty bloody good. Goran Dragic, dealing with a foot problem, 7,500. That foot problem bothers me because his recent form has been down. If they're correlated, I want nothing to do with it. Absolutely nothing. But what it does open up is Tyler Johnson, who's at 6,100 and put up 36 in the last game and has an opportunity to do that again. Now, I don't think that it's you know, set for cash. Um, but I think it's I think it's all right. But it, it's, it's not a must-play guy. 5,800 on DraftKings does make it more appealing, but I reckon it's only for the brave-hearted. Shooting guard, Joshy Richardson, 4,600. You're going to get over 20. You're going to get 21, 23, 22, that sort of mark, and that's all right at 46. It's not quite there, but it's okay. But I feel pretty bloody good about Josh Richardson saying, I'll get 23 points out of him. Can he get high? Yeah. So I I'd actually don't hate him on Fangio. I think that there's significant upside to go much better. He hasn't done it for a long time, but I think he's got upside to get there. Now, at 52 on DraftKings, I just don't think that's interesting at all. Kentavious Caldwell Pope is always a GPP guy. At small forward, Marcus Morris, 5,000. Shit matchup, shit player. No. Scooter Magruder, no thank you. Power forward, Toby Harris, 5,400. I like Toby here. I think that he's probably not a high upside GPP guy, but I reckon he's a pretty decently solid cash option on both sides, less so on DraftKings, but still okay. Well, Jimmy Johnson at 6,200. Love the Jimster, but I'm not sure that it's 6,200 that I'm just going to say, all right, lock him in for 34 and let's go. I just don't feel that we're quite at that level with Jim, so that's too high. And DraftKings at 6,600, they're, they're kidding themselves. Uh, the tackle box at 4,300, no. At center, we've got Andre Drummond. He's at 7,600. He has done exceedingly well against Miami before with a 52-point average the last three times that he's faced them. That's good. Drummond's consistency is bad. So you look at him as a GPP guy, of course, with the, with the ability to really, really go off, as you can see. As for Hassan Whiteside, 8,800, probably a little bit expensive, but I don't actually hate Hassan for cash. I reckon against Drummond, he's going to be able to come out there and put up the 40-plus on a pretty regular basis, I think that he's um, he's not a bad option. At 82 for Hassan on DraftKings, it's even better. The next game that's up on the slate, what have we got here? The Phoenix Suns and the Atlanta Hawks. The Hawks are favored by 7.5 and, and the total is 215. We don't know the status of Ronnie Price, who's got a leg contusion, or Leandro Barbosa, who missed the last game with a hamstring. Obviously, the absences of both those guys mean more minutes for Tyler Eulis and Devin Booker and guys like Derek Jones Jr., Jared Dudley, um, Jarrell Eddy, perhaps, as well. But the big factors are going to be Eulis and Booker. Let's talk point guards. As for Eulis, it's 6,969. Giggity! Thank you, Quagmire. Um, yeah... I reckon that's probably a little high. Yeah, 6,900 is a little high, but DraftKings has him down to 6,000, and that I think is worthwhile. 
against a great matchup against Schroeder and the Hawks. We've seen point guards do it all season. You're talking 35, 40 point upside here for Euless. We don't know. We're going to see big Booker night, big Euless night, split night. It can happen in many different ways for Phoenix. But I feel pretty good about him at that uh, $6,000 price tag where he currently sits over on DraftKings. Oh, sorry, not Fangio is 6000 My mistake. He's 69 on DraftKings, which is, uh, which is too high. So flip all that and reverse it. Dennis Schroeder, 7200 Super matchup for him. I have absolutely no problem with using Schroeder at in cash or in tournaments. He could have 45. He could also have 10. But I feel pretty good in this game against Euless of him going out there and dropping you know, 20 and 8 and putting up 36 points and at 7,600 just being a general badass. Shooting guard, Timmy Hardaway, 5,900. Yep, love the matchup. Couldn't get any better. It should be getting 30. He's contributing in multiple categories now. I really like this for Tim. He's at 65 in DraftKings, so less like, but still okay because the scoring system does favor him. Devin Booker at 7,600 has a 53-point average over his last three games because one of them was a 92-pointer. means the other two combined for just 60 points, so 30 points each, basically. 7,600 for Devin. He's really, really pushing the friendship unless you think he's dropping 70 again, and I do not. So I will fade Devin Booker at that sort of a salary. At small forward, TJ Warren, 6,400. Big return in the last one. Very good matchup. No Tarbo, no Kent Bazemore, no Paul Millsap, who, by the way, if you own him in seasonal leagues, he's out for three more games. Ars is gone. Get rid of him. See you later. TJ Warren, 6,400. Like it. TJ Warren on DraftKings, 7,200. Less likable. Still still okay, but yeah, that's that's probably pushing it a little bit far. Torian Prince is at 3,800. No Millsap, no Tarbo, no Kent. It means pretty much a guarantee of 30 for Torian. And um, look, he had a big one in the last game. He also played well as well. 33 minutes for Princey. No, th- no, 38 minutes and 33 points. 3,800, real tough to go past at that price. He's at 4,800 on drafting, so I should put a little bit of hesitancy in what you do, but I don't think it should fully scare you off. But I love him at that um, at that um, 38 on on Fangio. You put him and you know, Euless together, really good stack of this Atlanta Phoenix game. There's some pretty good value. Timmy Hardaway, big source. TJ Warren, Den Schroeder, lots of options to uh, stack up in this game. What else are we looking at? Small forwards again. No one else? No. Power forwards. Ursan Ilyasova, 4,800. Really, really good matchup. We saw him have 18 boards in the last one, and now he gets to take on the the anti-rebounder, and that's Marquise Chris. We've seen Biggs blow up against the Suns. Ursan's going to start. He should play 30 because Torian's going to be playing a lot more of his minutes at the three. I don't think we're going to see massive amounts of Chrissy Humphreys. 4,800 for Ursan. It feels, it feels like free money. 6,000 on DraftKings is definitely more, is sharper pricing. And that makes it harder to use him. It's not impossible, but he's he's not a core player over on uh, over on DraftKings. Marquis Chris at 5,100, terrible in the last game, and it wasn't foul trouble. Only 16 points in 30 minutes, but he'd been pretty good before that. I feel all right about using Chris and rolling him back out there. I don't think fouls are going to be too much of a problem unless he starts going on a Hacker Dwight situation, but at 5,100, I like it. 57 on DraftKings, yeah, not quite not quite there with Chrissy at that. Centers, big source, 5,400. I like him for cash. I don't think the upside's really there for tournament, but I do like it for cash for Allen. While Dwight Howard, quietly going really well. His lowest score in his last five games is 32 points. Lowest. At 7,200, I will take that as a floor every day of the week. And then he takes on the Suns. He takes on Alex Land and Alan Williams and Marquise Chris. And he will body the shit out of them. It is going to be a big, big night for Dwight relative to rest of season production. He's not doing Rudy Gobert. He's not doing Anthony Davis. But I feel pretty good about Dwight being that 7,200. And at 76 on uh, on DraftKings, the same. Really, everything is is working in his favor here. As for Alex Len, at 5,000 bucks, I, I don't I don't like it against Howard and with uh, Williams ready, firing, and there to take his minutes. The next matchup, the Philadelphia 76ers and the Brooklyn Nets. The Nets are favored by three, and the total is 221 points. We don't know if the heartbreak heartbreak kid, Sean Kilpatrick, is playing. 
He is listed as probable, so that's a good sign that he'll be back. Jumping Joe Harris is out already. So um, there's going to be some minutes there for KJ McDaniels, but don't get your KJ McDaniels bonus too hard yet. Just keep them just keep them in the semi position until we find out what's happening with Kilpatrick. I don't think there's much to see really from KJ, despite the, again, he very, very much a fantasy boner inducing player. At point guard, Jezza, Jeremy, Lynn. Fourth, not 4,000, shit, 4,000, you'd smash it. 5,800 for Lynn, 38 in the last game. He could really make some, uh, cause some damage here. Yeah, 30 points plus against the Sixers. I like Lynn. I like him at this price. Uh, I don't. It's not core by any means, but I like it. 59 on DraftKings, I like it as well. Spencer Dinwiddie is a minimum salary player, but absolutely no way of trusting him and minimum upside. So yeah, not interested, nor with Isaiah Whitehead. TJ McConnell at 5,500, just 500 too expensive, I'd guess. So not not feeling that. Same with Spanish Chocolate. At shooting guard, Sauce Castillo is at 3,600. Has been putrid the last couple of games. Throws a big one in there occasionally, but I'm not falling for it. Lawawu Cabarro, Levert. Um, Kilpatrick, McDaniels, Henderson, just a whole bunch of crap at shooting guard. At small forward, Bob Cubs at 6,700. Now the price is coming down. It's getting pretty sexy. I think there is real upside in this. I think I'd look at Bob as more of a GPP sort of a guy rather than being a lock. But shit, he could smash 45 here, and that's really good value. And I'm, I'm here for this Bob Cub game. Ronda Hellas Jefferson, I don't know what to make of this guy. I love him. He's averaging 32 over the last three. He had 32 in the last game. He's basically getting you 30. But the minutes are such a ridiculous pain in the cooler. I don't know. I don't know what to say about him. I don't feel confident about using him in cash because Atkinson will just come out and go, man, yeah, man, you're playing too well. 19 minutes. Bang. And we'll just go, oh, okay, cool. Sorry, mate. Um, why don't you play Quincy AC 25 minutes? And it, um, and it will piss us off. But he's been p- producing in great quantities in limited minutes and still under 5,000 where he can, where he's averaging over 30. That's great GPP upside. So I, I like, and if, if they go screw this shit, 30 minutes, mate, phew, shit, a lot of stuff could really happen with Rondo. That would make it uh, pretty, pretty interesting at power forward. Quincy AC. Cool. Dario Saric. 7,300, shit the bed in the last one. I think that's too expensive for Sharish. He's been too expensive for a while, and he's at 77 on DraftKings. I'm not interested in that whatsoever. Well, Holmesy, Rishon Holmes, we don't know the status of Jalil Okafor. If Okafor is out, obviously Holmes gets a boost, and at 5,700 has a real chance to clear that. If Jalil plays, it's harder, harder to use him. But I think you'd look at him as a GPP guy, even if Okafor was in the lineup. At center, Brook Lopez, 6,700 on Fangio. I like it. I like it a lot. 6,900 for him on DraftKings as well. Pretty good value. Good matchup. Yeah, really good record against Philly. You're talking 40 plus here for Brook. The other guy, the other sexy boy, Heartbreak Kid, Sean Long. What do we make of him? Smashing at the last two games. And a lo- I, I legit, and again, I don't, I don't bring this up to denigrate people or to you know, tease people. But legit, I got questions. Do I add Sean Long for the week for 12 team leagues? And I go, I'm just gonna maybe calm down a bit, mate. Like, let's just let's just not consider. And this was before today, so we're talking about not even as a, as a he's playing today. Let's add him. This was as let's add him for Monday, where he's not going to play. He put up some good games, no doubt. But is Sean Long the guy? You got to go, man. I've got to get my hands on Sean Long because he's going to do it all for me. Big night, big games. Minimal minutes. His two previous games where he's got big minutes, he hadn't been able to produce in that exact same level. He hadn't taken his per 30 production and extrapolated it, but he did in the last two. So it's up in the air. So he's absolutely got some GPP penis in him, but far from a must own guy or a core guy or a lock guy or whatever phrase you want to throw out there. But the uh, the sexy boy Sean Longlove has been. Uh, it's been an interesting development in the last two days when I reckon a lot of people would never have heard of this guy aside from two weeks ago, perhaps. I remember seeing him in Summer League. He looked he looked pretty good in Summer League. But yeah, a lot of people would never have heard of this guy. And they would have seen Sean Long going out there and there would have been the standard who? Cool. All right. Sometimes I'll, I'll put that up. You know, we, we tweet out inactives when we get the information and without fail, some smart ass will quote tweet it and it'll be like, who's an example? 
like before David Nwaba had started, or it was AJ Hammonds is inactive, and you get the who is this the NBA? Ha ha ha! And I reckon I reckon I did that with Sean Long, and and I got one of those responses, and now everyone's falling over themselves to go the old Turkish grip on him. Golden State and Houston, big game. Rockets are favoured. By one and a half points. This is going to be super. I mean, the last time that I remember, now it's probably a game in between, but I remember these guys played on a Thursday night in Golden State, went to overtime. The Rockets got a victory. Just an absolute fantasy shit show. There was just points flying off the board everywhere. And I say shit show in a good way. Could it happen again? Massive over under. 234 and a half. Close spread. Studs everywhere. Massive, massive stackable game. You talk about Atlanta Phoenix being the stackable game. Like this is another one. This is a huge, huge stack game, and there's a lot, lot to unpack here. At point guard, Pat Bev's at five thousand. He had a uh, not good night in the last one, under seven points. He has struggled in the past to get points against the Warriors. I'm not totally into it, but he's absolutely a guy that you would be looking at in a stack situation at that sort of a price tag. 49 on DraftKings as well. He does have some pretty good upside, and I, I wouldn't totally veer off him in, in cash, but I wouldn't be totally into it. Steph is at 99 on FanDuel. That's not bad. I like, I like it in GPPs. I like it quite a bit, actually. And at 94 on DraftKings, I reckon there is cash, bait, cash game playability in that too. Shooting guards, we're talking about three GPP specialists. Lou Williams at 4,600, who dropped 40 in the last game. Eric Gordon at 4,900, who played 36 minutes and started and will probably do the same again. He had 26 in that last game and, and is pretty much a lock for 25 points, another GPP. And Clay Thompson at 7,000 bucks, who could go for 60. These are very, very good GPP guys. And in any stack situation of these games, you've got to have, I reckon, two of them. You've got to have either Clay and Lou or Clay and Gordo. And which way you want to go depends on you. I'd probably go Lou just because he does have the higher upside over Gordon, but Gordon's probably going to get the more minutes. The rock solid shooting guard you're looking at is Jim Harden. 12,500 for Jim. If he doesn't get 50, I'd be surprised. Yeah, if he doesn't get close to 60, I'd probably be marginally surprised as well. Big, big spot for Jim and interested to see how he goes. Small forwards. Barnsey, 3,900. No, Iggy, 4,000. Oh, I heard that he hates that nickname, so I better not call him that. 4,800 for Andre Iguodala. He dropped 40 in the last game, probably a high point for him. 4,800 just feels like there's not not really anywhere to go. Trevor Ariza at 54. Yeah, I'm, I'm in for that. I like that. I actually don't even mind it for cash, but I, I do like it a lot for GPP. Sammy Decker, no thanks. At power forward, Draymond Green, 7,700. Did, does very well against Houston. I reckon this is a very good spot to use Draymond. He's been down, no doubt, averaging under 30 over the last five. But this is um, this is a, a great GPP opportunity. I'm not into him in cash, though. There's no Ryan Anderson for Houston, so Clint Capella at 5,500 now. The center's getting obliterated by the Warriors narrative has has died off a little bit lately. And Clint Capella's the guy, one of the guys who can stick with him. He can, and this is why he's so good as a player. He can stick with Steph on a pick and roll. He can switch onto Steph and he can stay with him. He can stay with Clay Thompson. He can stay with these guys. He can get out onto the perimeter. He can guard them. He can play passing lanes. He can get a hand in their face. He can not get embarrassed out there. He can stick with them. And that means that he's not going to be you know, taken off the court. And the other reason is Ryan Anderson's not there to play the, the, the five in these smaller lineups. So I think if Clink doesn't get into foul trouble, you should get a pretty good game out of him. And, and I like him at 5,500. Is it 54 on DraftKings? I do. I, I do actually like Clint Capella here. I know I've said that a few times. Nene had a big game in the last one. I reckon he might struggle a little against the Warriors, but yeah, you could do worse. You could also do significantly better. The next game up, the Denver Nuggets, the Portland Trailblazers. Really, really interesting here. The team that wins this probably has inside track for the eighth seed. Portland wins it. You'd have to say their favorite. Denver wins it. You have to say their favorite, and that's just me saying exactly what I meant in the first part. The Blazers are favored by two. The total is 226 and a half. Injury-wise, we're good in this one, so that's always good news. Dame Lillard at 9,400. Dame Lillard, hot streak. Denver guards, do you go the Dame cash risk? I reckon I might. It's not something I would normally do, but I reckon I might. In this one, everything adds up his way. His consistency has been way up. 
And at 9,400, it's good. 10,300 on DraftKings, that can be folded up and really packed into its own asshole because I want nothing to do with that at 10,300. Sure, there's a little bit of upside there, but shit, that is too high. 9,400, you need to compare them. You go back and go, is that 9,400? That's looking kind of pretty sexy. So you could, you could definitely get some use to it. And the matchup is just so beautiful. Jameer Nelson, $5,000. Nah, sorry, man. The Blue Arrow. Jamal Murray, 3,900. Too many guys fit and firing for Denver for me to uh, care too much about him, unfortunately. At shooting guard, CJ McCollum, 6,900. Yeah, let's go with that. He's a 40-pointer here. A real 40-point upside. 72 on DraftKings. Less good, but still pretty good. So I'm, I'm in for that. Gaz Harris. Nice, Gary! 6,100. Uh, too high. Sorry, Gaz. With the rooster back, the shot attempts will come down a little. He won't be as baller as he has been at 54 on DraftKings. Oh, ooh. I am um, I am tempted, but I won't say that it's a that it's a lock or it's really a cash play. Farton Will Barton's pretty tough to use, and you'd only want to be using him in GPPs because he's still pushing six thousand bucks, and that's too high for a guy that's going to get twenty four minutes. Um, Flame and Mo Harkless at thirty six hundred. He's doing sweet FA, so let's uh, forget that. Baby Neck Wilson Chandler at six thousand three hundred, no chance, and the Rooster always too high, six thousand five hundred. Let's talk about the power forwards. Noel Vonley, he put up 24 points on the back of 14 rebounds in the last game. He's at 3,800. The return of Myers Leonard's taking him from 25 to 20, or from 28 to 25 minutes, and that's a, that's a worry. But I think at 3,800, you should feel pretty good about Vonley playing 25 minutes and getting 20 points, and that might be something that works for you. But you have to have a bit of confidence there. Nikola Jokic, 10,300. I reckon you're going to get a big Joker performance here. Um, terrible in that last outing where they got smashed by the Pelicans. But I think you're going to get a big one here from Nick. So I'm in for that. Myers, Leonard, Alfru, Camino, I'm not, not caring. Revenge game narratives. You know, I don't really buy into it. But if there's anyone who's a petty bitch in the NBA, I reckon it's going to be Yusuf Nurkic. And I reckon you might see either an ejection in the first five minutes or you'll see him go for 40 and 20 with 17 blocks. He's a real, real option here at 6,700 over on FanDuel. Over on DraftKings at 74, it's less interesting. But if you want to buy, and again, I don't buy into you know, narratives, revenge game narratives. They get overplayed. They get overvalued. They get underreported when it doesn't work. But sometimes, sometimes there's a player that's just enough of a prick to really, really just do do something weird. And I get the feeling Nurkic might be that guy. So that's something to watch. Now, Mason Plumley is not. I don't see that from him at all. So I don't see Mason Plumley going, right, I'm playing 30. Everyone, you know, get out of my way and, and jump on my back. We're carrying, I'm carrying this team to victory. That's just not what he's going to do. So there's not a lot, lot to like there. But Nurkic v. Jokic is, I think it might be spirited because um, Bosnians, Serbians, practice battles, elbows thrown. Maybe you just want to throw a match on that and see what happens. I reckon we could see something, uh, unless they're best mates. I'm not sure they are, though. Let's just see how it all uh, how it all pans out. Going to be interesting viewing, that's for sure. The last game of the night, the Washington Wizards and the Los Angeles Lakers. We should have Boyan Bogdanovich back, who missed the last game with back stiffness. And Yan Mihinmi, who didn't close out the last one with a hip pointer, he should be ready to play. Well, Brandon Ingram is listed as doubtful with this knee tendonitis issue that's bothering him. The Wizards are favored by nine, and the total is 226. This could be a very, very significant smashing from the Wizards. So using guys like Johnny Wall is a risk. He's at 10,200. He could easily drop 50, but he could also play 27 minutes. So I'm not feeling John... At that price, I think he's got upside, clearly, but I, I don't think it's... And especially with the, the size of the price rise that he just copped, I'm not really thinking this is going to be some sort of spectacular option. As for the Lakers, D'Angelo Russell, 6,500. Shit, not a terrible matchup against John Wall, but I actually think that it's not a bad play to use him. Um, you could do a lot worse at 6,500. D'Angelo's at 69 on DraftKings, of course he is. Giggity! And, and it's fine. I think there's upside to him. I'd probably look at him more as a GPP guy over on uh, DraftKings. Clarko's at 59. Yeah, not not loving it. I don't think he's the sort of guy that breaks out of that those shackles that much. If you want to go cheap, if you want to go weird, Tyler Ennis is a guy you look at. Minimum salary. Brandon Ingram not going to play. He dropped 
32 points in 26 minutes in the last game. He gets assists. He gets steals. John Wall's not shy about throwing turnovers. Tyler Ennis, at minimum salary, is the man you want, I reckon. 31 on DraftKings as well. Super, super, super cheap. And much, much more. Shooting guard, Brad Beal, 7,800. Yeah, if it wasn't the Lakers, I'd say fine. But it's the Lakers, so I'll say no. David and Waba, let's just say no together. Small Fort Otto Porter, 5,200. I'm not feeling Otto, sorry, mate. Boyan, always a GPP guy. And Corey Brewer, I don't care that he starts. It does not matter. At Power Ford, Larry Nance at 4,000. Something brewing here for Nance. He's been a little bit disappointed in the last couple of games, but I reckon he's in for a big one. 42 on DraftKings. I think we're going to see a decent uh, a decent Nancy performance here. Julius Randle, you can only use him in GPP. You cannot trust what Randle's going to do in cash. I, I can't see how you can do that. Well, Mark if Morris is just not happening for me. At center, Zubats at 4,400. Confidence is a bit limited because I don't know if he's going to play 30 or 19 or 24. And that's what takes the confidence. Well, if he plays 30, he smashes that, no doubt. But if he plays 24, it's touch and go. If he plays 20, eh, probably not. So there's a lot of variables there with Zubats. I don't want anything to do with Marching Gortat, of course. Well, Jan Mihinji at 3,200 on uh, DraftKings. You go cheap at center. I wouldn't be surprised to see 21 points out of Mihinji. Here in one of those weird games where he plays 24 minutes and gets four steals and has 10 points on eight shot or you know six shots and has 10 boards. I reckon it could be a, a sneaky Yan Mihimi. It's a couple of sneakies in this one. Tyler Ennis and Yan Mihimi. A couple of guys to pay attention to. Alright, let's go to the picks of the day. Fanjul Ish, 45. Yulis, 6,000. Dame Lillard, 94. Shooting guard Lou Williams, 46. Timmy Hardaway, 59. And Jim Harden, 12.5. At Small Ford, Torian Prince, 38, TJ Warren, 64, and Paulie George, 86. At Power Ford, Ursan, 48, Julius Randall, 69, and Jokic at 10, 3. And at center, Zubats, 44, Brooke Lopez, 67, and Carl Anthony Towns, 10,500. On DraftKings, Tyler Ennis, 31, Ish Smith, 5,000, and Steph at 94. Shooting guard, Monte Ellis, 44, Lou Williams, 52, and Jim Harden, 12, 3. At Small Ford, Larry Nance, 42, Chrissy Middleton, 62, and Yanni at 9, 7. Power forward, Myers Leonard, 3,000. Julius Randall, 7,000. And Townsies at 10-1. And at center, Mahinmi, 32. Capella, 54. And Jokic, 94. For an all-European center trio. Moneyball, Ishmith, 5,000. Yulis, 55. And Steph at 95. Shooting guard, Joshy Richardson, 4,000. Chrissy Middleton, 55. And Jim Harden at 13. Small forward, Torian Prince, 35. Ariza, 52. And Yanni at 10. Power forward, Larry Nance, 39. Ersan, 51. And at center, Zubats 46, Lopez 71, and Jokic 95. On draft stars, Eulis 6050, D'Angelo 13-1, and Lillard 17950. At shooting guard, Shabazz Muhammad 5350, Gaz Harris 8650, and Jim Harden 24-7. At small forward, Torian Prince 5250, Ursan 98. At power forward, Noel Vonley 5000, Jimmy Johnson 91, Dwighty Howard 14-150. And at center, Zubats 76, Nurkic 11350, and Carl Anthony Towns. 17,500. We're done. Follow me on Twitter at redrock underscore b-ball. And if you're still listening to this podcast and aren't still playing DFS or, or seasonal leagues, hit me up. Always want to know. I'd love to, I love, I love everyone who listens to this podcast, but I love the people who don't play fantasy and still listen because it means that, you know, I'm talking about something that is interesting in a, in a non-fantasy perspective as well. And that's really good to me uh, too. So shout out to you guys. Let me know if you are still listening in that sense. And remember, keep downloading the podcast, keep listening because there's going to be shit happening all the way through, all through the playoffs, all through the off season. The only time I take a break is when I head over there to do more work to watch some summer league stuff. So make sure you are checking out the show all through the off season. Give a subscription on iTunes. It's the best way to keep downloading the show and leave a review and it helps us get our word out to advertisers. We are done here, guys. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya. Adrian Wojnarowski.